Hey, good morning, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Eamon O'Reilly, and uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. I know it's early. It's uh, great to see a full crowd like this and the interest in uh, what we're doing with the OMS. Uh, so today we're going to really talk about operations management suite and go into all the different areas we have inside of the suite. And with me today have the lead program manager, managers for each of the areas we have inside of OMS. We're going to come up and kind of highlight what we offer and how they integrate together into kind of a unified OMS uh, solution that you can start using inside your own organization. So I think the first thing to start off with is, you know, what really is OMS? And it really, you know, consists of four major areas. And so the first one um, that I'm going to talk a lot about and that I work on is the automation and control. And so the goal really of OMS is that we give you unified management across your infrastructure and your applications. And so automation and control is really how you get all of your infrastructure under management, and I'll go into depth into that area. Uh, the second major area we have is insights and analytics. And this allows you to really understand what's going on inside your infrastructure and your applications, not only in um, your own on-premises data center, but as you start to move things into Azure or into other clouds, it allows you to get visibility and insights across all, everything inside um, your organization. The next big area that we have inside of uh, OMS is security and compliance. And we've really invested heavily inside of the security area over the last few years. And so as part of the OMS suite, you'll see that we've really brought in all of that insights, really understand what are the security threats, how can you actually go and mitigate those, and understand what is happening inside your organization. And then the last big area inside of OMS is protection and recovery. And so this really talks about how do I ensure that all of my data is actually protected so that we can recover it if needed, but also if you need to do a failover and you need to bring your assets that may be on premises and be able to fail those into Azure, how can we assist with that so you actually have a really good site recovery plan as you start to actually build out your entire infrastructure and be able to take advantage of some of the cloud capabilities we have inside of Azure. So that's really what it's about inside of OMS. And I think the key thing to take away from that is that it's designed, our whole design point was around making sure that you could manage all of your existing investments so a lot of you are probably using System Center today. So how can you take advantage of everything you've invested in System Center for your on-premises? And as you start to think about using OMS and you're bringing some of your resources into the cloud, how do we give you a unified view across your investments and everything you're managing today in your on-premises data center, plus give you that same view across what you're moving into Azure or even third-party clouds? And so that's really what OMS is about, and we've been kind of invested heavily over the last two years into that. And so you'll see that as we go through the rest of the session. So the idea behind OMS was we really wanted to build a modern cloud management. And the goal around this was what we've seen as people start to think about the cloud and all the capabilities it offers, you really want something that can actually scale with your organization as you start to look across all these different assets in your cloud and on-premises. And what we focused on was not only giving you the ability to manage your infrastructure, but also give you the ability to manage your applications. And so the real power is that you get unified management across your infrastructure and your applications at each level of the life cycle. And so obviously your life cycle involves making sure you have the right infrastructure under management so you, you can get all the virtual machines configured right, the networking, all of those capabilities. But then as you start to roll out applications as well, how do you put those under management? And so as you go through each part of the life cycle, we've invested inside of OMS, so we have a set of capabilities that highlight each point in this lifecycle process and allow you to get that management all the way from you know, building out your infrastructure, controlling it, so you can make sure that it um, has the right configuration on it, has the right applications installed, has your policy defined inside of that for both on-premises and in Azure or the clouds, but then go all the way through to insights, protection, security, governance. How do you actually get the full lifecycle inside of OMS? And so that's really what we're going to talk about today and how you can start taking advantage of that leveraging a lot of your system center investments, but then as you start to go to the cloud, how can you move your management to the cloud as well and start to give that consistent view across everything? Okay, so the first area that I talked about when we said what's inside of the OMS suite 
it really starts with the automation and control to some extent, because this gives you the uh, ability to put everything under management in a very easy way, so now you can actually configure it, deploy your policies, ensure everything is set up the way you need inside your organization, and allow your business teams and application developers to take advantage of the Azure while you still have that um, policy and requirements of IT layered on top of it. So in the automation and control space, it's the area I focus on, it really comes down to three major um, areas we have inside of this. So the first one is around process automation. And so process automation allows you to orchestrate how you want your infrastructure and your applications deployed. And the real power of that is you can automate how you want these services to be deployed across your on-premises in Azure in a controlled way by integrating all the existing systems you have. And so it's really built to allow you to integrate into your other management systems, system center components, as well as all of Azure in a unified way so you can actually deploy your infrastructure and your applications and put them under management. The second major area we invest in inside of automation and control is around configuration management. And so configuration management is how do I actually state my desired configuration onto these virtual machines, onto the infrastructure, onto the applications, so that you can actually define what that machine is supposed to look like, and you can actually define roles assigned to that, so that if you have a web server, IIS server, base, you can just assign those. And then the last area of focus inside of automation and control is around update management. And so how many of you guys have challenges with update management today? Good, you're probably leveraging a lot of SCCM, you might be using WSUS directly, you might be using something else, but we wanted to give you the ability inside of OMS to have a unified view across everything you have inside your environment. So not only everything you might have on premises that's being managed, but as you start to bring more and more assets into the cloud, a lot of those may not be domain joined, they may be domain joined. How do you still get visibility across what your compliance is and updates? And then not only give you that visibility, how can you actually go and actually enforce that compliance? How do you make sure those security updates are actually applied successfully and do all of that work? And so that's the other major area we have inside of automation and control. Okay, so I mentioned process automation. The major goal around process automation is we want to give the ability to actually integrate and orchestrate across your cloud and on-premises. And so one of the core tenets of that is how do you integrate systems together? So I know a lot of you are probably using other management systems. You may have a lot of them on-premises. You might be starting to have different management systems for the cloud. But how do you actually integrate all those into a unified way so you can orchestrate the deployment of your applications, the deployment of your infrastructure? And that's really where process automation comes in. And the main thing about that is it works across your cloud and on-premises, but it also works across Windows and Linux. And so you'll see one of the core things we've done with OMS is we've actually invested so that as we start to build out this management solution, it not only works across the infrastructure, your applications, but also across your OSs. So if you have Windows Server and Linux and you still want that same visibility, the same control, you can actually do that using OMS because we've kind of built it in from the ground up to actually manage Windows and Linux. And particularly around process automation, we really want to invest to make it very easy for you to, some of you may be using Orchestrator inside of System Center, you may have other automation tools. Probably most of you are familiar with PowerShell, hopefully. So we've natively built in PowerShell support and graphical authoring into OMS so you can define your processes and then actually enforce those as uh, customers need them. So the second major area I talked about was configuration management. And so how we do configuration management is we basically leverage the core technology that was in Windows Server. And so in uh, 2016 and even 2012 R2, there was a technology called desired state configuration that was available. And so we actually leverage that core technology in the service to allow you to configure all of your Windows servers. But not only that, DSC is also available inside of Linux. So now you can configure how your infrastructure, how those virtual machines are supposed to be set up using DSC. And not only that, all of the management of that happens from the cloud. So now you can get, actually get visibility, get control of everything from the cloud, but it can be for on-premises, infrastructure, as well as Azure, or even third-party clouds. So you can deploy everything you need and get them under that desired state configuration. Again, it's not only for Windows, um, it's also for Linux. And then the second major area we have around configuration management is around change tracking. 
So I think most of you know, I know myself, usually when we're troubleshooting even our own service, the first thing we try to figure out is, well, it was working you know, yesterday. What happened so now that we're getting all these tickets and all these incidents coming up? And typically what happens is changes have happened in your environment that actually causes your application, your infrastructure, not to behave the way it was supposed to be. And so what we've built in is a powerful capability for you to understand what changes are happening across those Windows and Linux environments. So you can drill in fast to say, oh, this update is a change that happened, and so this is probably affecting, and that's why I'm getting those tickets. And so all of that is built into OMS, and again, it's all delivered from the cloud, both for your on-premises and inside of uh, Azure. And then I talked uh, for a couple of minutes around update management. This is the kind of the final pillar we have inside of the automation and control space. And this gives you the ability to get that visibility across your environment. And so it doesn't matter if it's being managed by SCCM or WSUS or you're just using Windows Update directly. As you start to move some of those resources into the cloud, how do you get that continuous visibility and compliance across everything in your organization and built for scale? So not only does it give you that visibility so you know if you're up to date and you know your compliance, it actually has really rich um, troubleshooting capabilities built in. So if you know something's gone wrong, you can zero in quickly, identify what those problems are, and be able to resolve them. And one of the major um, areas we invest in here as well is trying to, because all of this has been delivered from the cloud, as we learn more and more about these updates and the success rate of these updates, we can give you that visibility back in so you can actually see which updates may be causing challenges, which ones you have to invest more in testing in your own private environment before you roll out across your organization. And so this is some of the power you get by actually moving towards OMS and taking advantage of, in some ways, it's big data inside of our um, service so we can actually do that analysis and give you that value back as you start to move towards um, update management in OMS. And again, the key thing to think about here is it's not only, again, for Windows, which you know, we know a lot about and we specialize in, but we've actually worked a lot with our customers who have Linux in their environment as well. And the same type of challenges exist there. You know, they don't really know. They know there's a lot of these updates and these security um, events coming for their Linux environment, but it's very difficult to tell which of their servers is actually not compliant with those. And so we've invested a lot to actually give you that visibility as well by looking across your infrastructure and in your cloud and telling you which of those updates for Linux are really required and then the ability to actually go and set those as well. Okay, so with that, I'm going to jump in and actually give you a quick demo of these capabilities so you can actually see them in action. And then we have further sessions if you want to go deep into any specific area. Um, I have a list at the end of all the um, sessions we have inside of OMS that you can go deeper. Some of them have happened. A lot are still going on today, Thursday, and Friday. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this here. So this is the automation and control area we have inside of the portal. So again, it's all running from the cloud, but you get management across everywhere. And so I just want to show you a quick um, view into some of these capabilities. So the first one I talked about was around process automation and how you can actually use orchestration and use runbooks, which can be PowerShell or graphical, to actually deliver services on demand um, and integrate into systems. So I'm just going to browse. So we have integration with the PowerShell gallery. So how many of you guys are familiar with PowerShell and use it? Awesome, that's what we expected, which is great. It's almost everyone. And so we natively support PowerShell inside of the service, so, but we also integrate with PowerShellGallery.com. And so all of that community resources, all of that knowledge that's been built up over the last few years is available to you inside the service. But I'm going to actually filter out here and actually look at a graphical runbook, because um, some of you may be familiar with Orchestrator and the kind of nice simplicity we have of understanding what the process is. We also have that inside of here. I'm actually going to search for backup. So here I have a graphical runbook that's available inside the gallery, and I'm just going to go ahead and import it. And so what this is doing, just when I click, it actually brings in this runbook so you can actually go and use it inside of the automation and control service. 
and I'll just zero in real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what this runbook does are really these building blocks. So how do you get started actually orchestrating, doing all this process automation? One of the key advantages is take advantage of the gallery. There's so much content out there, either from graphical and all of the PowerShell, not just the scripts, but all of the modules. All of those can be imported into the service, and you can start using them straight away. And this simple runbook, all it does is it actually analyzes everything you have inside of Azure. It detects which of the uh, virtual machines are not under backup, because you may have ones that in certain subscriptions or certain resource groups that you know you have to have that compliance around backup. It will actually detect those, and then according to your backup policy, will actually go and apply it straight away for you. And so all of this can be automated. You can put it on a schedule, and you're now ensured that every time a virtual machine gets created, you can actually put it under IT management and set the right policy and compliance just by scheduling this simple runbook. And then obviously, because it's yours, you can extend it for your own special needs. That's really the power of process automation. Not every single scenario is the same. Most of you have to actually change them for your specific needs, but having the building blocks gives you that flexibility. Okay, so the other thing I'm just gonna uh, type in real quick here is DSC. And so this is exactly almost the same kind of building block. I'm not gonna import this one, but I'll just show it. You can see it hopefully there a little bit. But this does a very similar thing. It scans your entire environment, and it says, okay, I actually want all these machines under management, so now I can apply policy. And so what it does is it looks at every machine, and it can determine if it's under our management, then it just says, okay, if not, it will actually bring it under the automation control service using our desired state configuration, and now you can apply your policy directly inside of the OS as well. And so once you have your machines under management, that's kind of the first thing you want to do, because now you have control over those. And you can do the control up front, you know, as you deploy out your new images or your applications, you can basically ensure that you have configuration management enabled so you automatically get compliance, or you can retroactively do it afterwards using some of those runbooks I've sh uh, shown. But either way, you want to get it under management with desired state configuration because now you can set policies right up front to ensure you can successfully manage it. And so how that's done, it's very simple. All of those machines now, so these are machines that are running on-premises and in Azure for both Windows and Linux. It doesn't really matter. You have the management control inside of here. And all you have to do is select a machine that may not have be under the um, configuration you want, and you can actually just assign it whatever configuration you want. And so typically what you'll end up doing is assigning roles. So you know, you'll have your developer saying, I need a SQL server, and then you have all these rules and compliance that says here's the standard SQL server you're supposed to get. You can define those inside of a configuration and then automatically assign it. So every time a SQL server is requested, you can stamp it out exactly for what you need. And the benefit of stamping those out exactly for web servers, SQL servers, it could be SharePoint, it doesn't matter. You stamp those out automatically. You also can install any of the agents you need for like monitoring, for backup. All of that can be done through the configuration service. And it's as simple as just assigning these configurations. Again, there's a lot available out there in the gallery. Um, I have a lot here. I won't go into the details. We have a session on Friday if you really want to go deep into all the DSC capabilities we have. But within that, it gives you that management uh, function. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna show real quick is actually go into update management so that you can see a little bit of the update management capabilities we have as well as the change tracking. And so for those who aren't familiar with, OMS has been around for a few years, so we had a separate portal, which is um, the portal you're seeing here now. This basically has the same capabilities that I've shown you inside of Azure, but directionally we're starting to move all of these capabilities natively into Azure as well, so with inside the same portal, you can not only manage all the Azure resources seamlessly, you can manage all of your infrastructure and your on-premises data center all from the same portal. Um, but inside of here is where I'm gonna show it to you just as an alternative you can use. Okay, so I'm gonna go to uh, update management. And straight away here, I'm looking across everything I have in my environment. Windows, Linux, on-premises, Azure, AWS, it doesn't matter. We gain all of that insights across Windows and Linux, and we tell you what compliance state are you in? Which of your servers aren't actually up to date? How long are they out of date? So has, is there certain security updates that have never gotten deployed? You can see all of that functionality inside of here. And you can go in, once you've identified what you want to roll out, you can actually go to manage updates and actually deploy all of these 
um, required updates to meet your compliance across everything in your environment. So for on-premises and in the cloud, and then get back all that detailed reporting, detailed diagnostics. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Joseph in a second, but just before I do that, I wanna give you a quick view into change. Uh, again, I talked about what usually causes problems in your environment. This is one of the benefits of getting everything under configuration um, management, is that now you can see what changes are happening in your system. And so if you get an incident, you said, well, it happened on Friday, you can just quickly drill down to say, okay, well, even if it happened today, I can go in here and say, across everything I have in my environment, here are the changes that have happened. And you can see which software's changed, which updates have changed, what services have been stopped, what files you want to track that might be modified. And very quickly, you can drill all the way into what you need. You can figure out which servers are affected by these changes. And then you can go into the full list and get all the detail about what changes happened so you can determine what action you want to take from there. And then once you've said, well, if this is a problem, I want to get alerted every time these changes are happening, you can go in here, select one of those orchestration runbooks I talked about. It can send you an email, it could open up a ticket, it could actually do some remediation. But ideally, if that change is, is really a problem that's persistent and it keeps showing up your, across your environment, why allow the change to happen? Leverage desired state configuration Set that configuration so that application never gets installed, that registry never changes, the firewall never gets modified. All of that power is available to you through the DSC service, so you'll never see this issue again. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand over to Joseph, and he is going to go through the second major area we have, which is insights and analytics inside of the OMS service. All right, thanks, Joseph. Amen. Appreciate it. Can you plug this in for me? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I'll send back the slides. Maybe we should test it real quick. Just uh, yeah, just goes okay. over to uh, five. Five, okay. And slides is, everybody see it okay? Looking good, all right, number two? Uh, nope, six. Number six, okay. Well, how are you all doing? Good, first session in the morning. Do you all, like, you know, hopefully there's not too much drink last night? Yeah? Okay, I mean, like, we're on, Wednesday already, so you know, drinking, getting started. Um, how many of you use this OMS already? All right, all right, so not a whole lot of intro I need to go through, this is pretty awesome. Okay, so um, for a little bit of uh, personal uh, gain I'm trying to do here, uh, if you wanna get update on anything related to log analytics, follow me on Twitter, uh, that's my handle over there. Um, you know, there's not much to do right now, so you can actually just start following me now. Um, and literally, this is where I basically give you um, new feature updates, um, and you can just follow me on there, and I actually check back my own Twitter feeds to uh, send reports up to my management about what we have released. So uh, this is my official report. Okay, so what is log analytics? I did see like about one third of the hands that was not raised and uh, you know, maybe you're not familiar with OMS, you're not familiar with log analytics, uh, but what log analytics is, is, is one of the base foundational services that is part of the operation management suite. What it allows you to do is to collect, search, and analyze any machine data, okay? Machine data is basically any semi-structured or uh, unstructured data that are generated by your servers, your systems, endpoints, devices, and whatnot, right? They typically come in the form of uh, metrics or events. Uh, some of them have some structured part of it, like you, know, you have the date timestamps, you have the machine name, you have the, maybe the event ID, but the rest of the, the payload of the data is usually unstructured, right? It could be like a bunch of like text that says like, you know, oh, the system terminated unexpectedly and here's the problem, blah, 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 right? And every single event is different. Other than the ID portion of it, um, you know, that is very different. It comes in very high volume, extremely high velocity coming in, and you need a hyperscale system that can really withstand that type of load, right? Um, a lot of people try to do this on their own. I mean, there are a bunch of open source options out there. Um, it gets pretty exciting, you know, for the first six months, and then after you operationalize it, not so much fun anymore. 
Um, and so, you know, we have talked to a lot of guys at, about, you know, where they, they stand up their own log analytics uh, uh, a cluster. And it was really fun for the first year. And then they get the devs to, or, or app team to start work, uh, using it. Right? They add more dashboard, they add more queries, thing gets slowed down, they point their finger at the guy who stand up the, uh, the log analytics cluster, and the guy was like, dude, just stop creating all these dashboards. We're like, we love this stuff, so we want to add more. And uh, thing slows down, it's all his fault. Right? Now, with log analytics in OMS, it's all our fault if thing slows down. Right? You know who is the person to point their finger to? All right? It's me, right here. You can point your finger at me. And so it's awesome, okay? And I love getting pointed at. Um, and, um, and, and we're definitely uh, always working to improve the scale and the performance of the system. Now, we call this a hyperscale service is because there's no limit to our scale. There's no limit. You can bring in, I don't know, 500 gigs a day, no problem. You want to bring in 2 terabytes a day, no problem. You want to bring in 10 terabytes a day, no problem. You want to bring in 100 uh, 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 a thousand events per second, no problem, right? We have hundreds of sensors throughout different tiers of our service to sense the pressure point that as you bring in the, the, the data, right? And we scale out accordingly. And we spend a lot of time. We run hundreds, thousands of experiments to ensure that we give you the most optimal configuration at the best price point with the best experience in terms of query performance to, to basically surface this to you trouble free, right? So it's an awesome service. Log analytics, though, is not just about collecting logs. It's really what we envision to be the next generation monitoring service. If you think about it, how many people of you uh, in, the, in the audience right now use a SCOM? Awesome. Well, I used to be a SCOM guy. I, uh, I was the lead PM for the SCOM agent management server as well as the, the database uh, uh, tier. And so I love SCOM, but you know, it also has this limitation. That's why we started this service to see how we can um, uh, work on portion of the system that uh, has is um, um, a bottleneck and basically freed you from uh, uh, those constraints, right? And one of the, the, the part of the, the system is that the reporting portion, the data warehouse is extremely difficult to manage. Who loves managing your, your data warehouse for SCOM? Okay. Uh, I, I thought that I would at least see two hands, but you know, I guess not. Um, but we started this project because of the data warehouse. Everybody complains about it. It's like, I don't want to be a DBA. I don't want to manage the index. I don't want to optimize the query performance. I don't want to deal with grooming. The report doesn't really work, right? If I can get the reports to run, writing those custom reports is really hard. It's just the nightmare never ends. With this, you don't have to deal with any of that, and writing reports or dashboard now is just fantastic. It's actually enjoyable. I use it every day, I love it. And so um, um, we started the project to provide insights and reporting. But what we realize is that when we turn all the agents out there into data sources and we remove the agent's burden from doing conditional uh, 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 thresholding and move that logic up into the search tier, you can now do centralized correlation from the cloud side, it gives you tremendous ability to define complex monitoring uh, logic from the cloud. How many of you try to write a, um, a, a, a workflow or a monitor in SCOM that try to correlate data across maybe, I don't know, 20 servers? Oh, there's, there's, there's two, three hands, yeah. Four, five, yeah. You like that? You like doing that? No, <laughs> okay, right. Um, it's much easier now. Who, who have tried to correlate data with uh, log analytics from the cloud in, in that similar scenario? Yeah? How do you like it? Works good? Yeah? Great. Thank you. Uh, so it, it's, it's much easier. I'm going to show you how that works in, 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 in a moment. Whoa. It's like 10 minutes in already. Um, so this is a deep dive session, and I was graciously granted 15 minutes to do a deep dive on this topic, which I tried to do with five hours and failed. So... Um, so we'll see where we're going to get to in five more minutes. But you know, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you're able to perform those searches, we are now able to run those searches almost at near real-time fashion as the data comes in. So what happens is the cloud searches turns into monitor that runs in the cloud, okay? And so which in turn turn log analytics 
into a monitoring service. And the service is built from the ground up to be hybrid, so you can manage both on-premises system as well as Azure. And so uh, who has attended the uh, session yesterday about managing infra and application using OMS? Tuesday session. Not a lot of hands. If you did not have a chance to watch that, um, I would say that go back to look at the recording once it's available. Uh, my team, Richard Rundle, Liz Kim, and Evan uh, Hissey was presenting on there. It gives a great deep dive into, a real deep dive into um, um, the how-tos on how you can monitor on-premises system, how you can uh, basically pipe in all the Azure-related uh, telemetry, bring it into one system across multiple subscription, across multiple resources, and allows you to enable that monitoring that you really wanted uh, all along. So, you know, this is not really a new system. You're not a guinea pig trying something, you know, that is experimental. Um, we have been G8 for well more than a year right now, and we have more than 50,000 plus customer accounts that are open. We manage more than 20 petabytes of searchable documents. Now, this is not just the amount of data that we have ingested. We have ingested far more than 20 petabytes of data. But because data groomed out over time, Right, so there are a lot of data that you know, it fell outside of the, the pricing tier that you paid for. So, that's not the, so some of the data got groomed out. Right? But 20 petabytes of data is the amount of data that we have right now sitting in our system that is searchable. You want to call upon and get this data right now, you can get it in under a second. Okay, this is how powerful this system is. 20 petabytes of, of document. We were, last time I was at Ignite, I was at about um, less than five petabytes, okay? So this thing is growing tremendously fast. And we serve more than 188 million queries per week. Last time I was here, I served less than 30 million queries per month. So now we're servicing 188 million queries per week. So this system is proven to be extremely scalable, extremely performant, and is growing really fast. The adoption of that is really widening, and you don't want to miss out. We're really forming a new community and a new industry around this uh, uh, service, and it's something that you can have the confidence to jump on board on. It's great for your career. Trust me in this, okay? And so um, it's something that is growing really rapidly. And in terms of the functionality of log analytics, right, we have invested heavily over the last year on how you can enable you to grab the data that you want from whatever device, endpoint, or services that you need. Last time when I showed this picture, I probably have less than half of the collection points that was available that is available on this chart right now, okay? Um, since last time we were here at Ignite, we have since enabled the HTTP Data Collector API, which is a programmatic way of allowing you to send data via PowerShell, Python, C Sharp, whatever you want, right, directly from your applications or, um, or, or through your own scripting on a server to send data to us, right? We can accept any form of, uh, of flat or at least three layers deep uh, JSON document, okay? So you can be three layer nested, uh, inside your JSON document, or you can just send it flat, which looks really simple. It's just a bunch of like basically property value key pair, and you send it in, and it'll be searchable, okay? And so you can basically send almost anything to us. We have also enabled a first class pipeline with Azure, so you can basically send this data in real time to us, um, and without going through like storage accounts or event hub, none of that stuff, right? So if you're familiar with how Azure telemetry works today, you can configure a service or a resource, send data out to a storage account, and then usually you will buy some third-party product and have to pick it up from the storage account. And what happens is that there's a lot of latency involved, right? And you have to pay for the storage cost inside the storage account, right, in Azure. And on top of that, you still need to pay for the storage for the third-party tool, right? With Log Analytics, you have that data shoot straight over nearly almost zero latency coming right through the pipe into our system, and you only pay for the cost of using log analytics alone, which is tremendous, is really awesome. And you can get it for diagnostic logs, activity logs, and metrics. And on top of that, it's not just ingesting those raw data uh, uh, right in. What we do is we look at and examine the data inside that payload, and we parse out the fields in there so that is immediately searchable and is immediately useful. One of the things that my team did was, for example, 
inside the resource, they have a thing called resource ID, okay? That resource ID is basically a path that tells you what is the subscription ID, the resource group, the resource type, the resource name, and, and then there's some other complex stuff, like if you use a SQL Azure uh, Elastic Pool, and there's a pool name, there's the database name, there's a server name, all inside a giant long path, right? And that's all you got, and you have to parse it out yourself. With log analytics, when you subscribe to that particular channel and you want to grab the data in from that particular provider, we cleanly break out those fields for you so that when you want to do a search on a particular provider type, you just say provider type equals to SQL, and off you go. So it's really awesome. Now, we also enabled some SaaS services pipeline as well, uh, which includes Office 365 and App Insights. How many people of you use this App Insight in here? A few hands, a few hands, okay. and. Um, and you know the, the limitation around that today, right? Which is that it um, forces you to look at the, the, the views on a per application basis. What we have allowed you to do with Log Analytics is to integrate all those different application insights accounts, pipe it all in into a single workspace so you can search across all those applications, okay? They're really application components, they're not applications, so you're trying to really look at a view from an application perspective. Um, and then to get insight off of that, right? Across multiple subscriptions, again, right? Really, really powerful stuff. Um, I guess I'm really out of time already, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to skip this slide. The point here really is about the fact that we're a platform that can run multiple solutions, and we use multiple engines to provide insights. Again, I've talked to the data sources already, so this is a really powerful platform, okay? And one thing I want to show you is really quickly, without, uh, I think we're just going to show a screenshot, is how MSIT actually uses this to monitor their connected devices uh, uh, scenario in all of Microsoft conference room, okay? My Microsoft has thousands of conference rooms across our global campuses. And, you know, and these are really important uh, assets because execs walks in, teams walks in, and we do a lot of work in these environments. And guess what? A year ago, things are just broken all the freaking time. You go in, projector doesn't work, you know, the phone doesn't work, nothing freaking works, okay? It's just frustrating. And everyone is just cussing and cursing all day long. And so, um, obviously, it reflects poorly on MSIT, you know, when, yeah, you know, nothing works, right? So, you know, they got on it and really started to look at devices in these conference rooms from an IoT perspective. They treat these as Internet of Things devices. So, for example, in this conference room that I'm showing right here in our Vancouver, BC office, beautiful office, there's a service hub that is uh, uh, mounted on the wall. Obviously, there's phone speaker system that is um, uh, within the conference room, right? Um, there's internet connected uh, 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 devices that allows you to you know, hook up to Skype and, and, and everything so that you know who is booking the room. You can go in and check the calendar, take notes, and you know, enable the meeting and so forth. And all of these uh, capabilities is now integrated into a single solution in OMS that they custom built called Unified Conference Room and Devices Solution. Okay, you can see that in the lower right hand corner. Um, and what you get inside that particular solution is the health of the Surface Hub device or any type of display device, um, the live room uh, service uh, uh, health, the polycom system which sits there, uh, allows you to make phone calls and, 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 and the Creston uh, uh, devices that really connected all the devices via Bluetooth within the room. All these things are all connected and piping data up into OMS so that they can get a unified view on that. They're really operationalizing um, all these uh, conference rooms, thousands of them, uh, into a single view, right? And allows you to drill down into it to see the health of that, to understand what's going on, okay? So that's one use of OMS to really flexibly allow you to monitor almost anything you want, right? And so um, I'm gonna wrap up with Log Analytics and skip through a couple of these things, right? And just emphasize that you can now build your own solutions. Um, you can build it inside the account or you can build it with our SDK, right? So here are some uh, uh, links here that's available. You can just download the slides, click on these uh, articles to get started. You can actually publish them. All of our solutions right now are Azure resources, so you can actually basically instantiate it on there via ARM template, right? These are all just ARM configuration in Azure, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, don't worry, it's just a pile of JSON documents that you fill in the blanks in there, and you're off, you're, you're good to go, okay? So, I just wanna end with this slide. It's just amazing, you know, the amount of integration point that we have. 
right? We have less than one third of this last year, and now we have a page full of integration point, which is tremendous. And that's not all. We got more on the insights and analytics um, uh, a pillar, and we'll hand it off to, to Nick, which is something that you've all been waiting for, application dependency monitoring. And this thing is hot. And I think we're ready, right, Nick? Yes, sir. All right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so, yep. So you think about this amazing big data analytics platform that Joe's talking about. You think about all of this information, all this telemetry, all these logs, all of these alerts and metrics that you can pull into your, into your, your OMS workspace. But one of the challenges that we hear a lot is, how do I understand the impact? How do I understand if I'm looking at an alert, is this going to affect my service? Is it being caused by something that I depend on, but I have no control over? If you think about this, you know, us as people who are in here managing these systems, we're not just managing systems, right? We're not managing VMs or instances of SQL Server or instances of, of WebSphere, et cetera. We're trying to manage business services that depend on this infrastructure that we're managing. So at the end of the day, what we hear is, I want to understand how these systems interact with each other, how they depend on each other to deliver that service. I want to have a view that allows me to tie these things together. Take all of the analytics that Joe's talking about. Give me context so I can see, yep, these are the five alerts that really are relevant to me right now because I'm trying to troubleshoot my Acme customer portal app. And then, as Eamon was talking about, change is so critical, right? But again, I want to understand the impact of change and the context of what I'm responsible for. So that may be, hey, I'm the director of ops and I'm responsible for all these business applications running in my environment. That could be, you know what, I'm the app server admin or I'm the web admin and people are yelling at me because the app is slow, but I don't understand if it's actually something in my environment or if it's something that I depend on. So what if I could tell you that we can give you the ability to automatically discover these dependencies, right? Automatically understand across any of your Windows and Linux VMs, I and mean, it doesn't matter where they are, could be on-prem in your data center, could be in Azure, could be in AWS or any other cloud. What if I could tell you that we're gonna see not just node to node or server to server connections, but the ability to actually see any TCP connected process. That could be your core.net, Java, or custom applications. That could be some rogue process that's running inside of your VM, chewing up resources and causing issues. So what if I could now tell you, on top of that, we're gonna give you the ability to dynamically detect changes in this environment, right? No longer having to come in and say, oh, I'm gonna go run netstat and try and see what's connected to what right now, but over time, doesn't matter how short-lived one of these processes may be, you're always gonna have visibility to what's going on in that environment, whether it's now or whether it was the same time yesterday. Then, think about, again, log analytics and think about all the alerts and all the information you can pull that, and what if I can now put that in context on top of this dependency view? So I guess you can tell what I'm gonna come with next. Now you can. So we're very excited to announce this week in, in limited preview, application dependency monitor. This is all really about three kind of core pillars here. It all starts with that discovery, right? That ability to know that for any, any particular Windows or Linux VM, I have full visibility to all of those TCP connected processes and the ability to then start thinking about in the context of incident management, how do I start overlaying things like performance? How do I start integrating in their change so that if people are yelling at me and I'm, they're screaming and saying it's slow, I can come in and see, did someone make a change to this box? Is it something that I don't own, but I can quickly go assign an incident over to them? Then we're also gonna talk a little bit more about migration, and actually, just a quick plug, on Friday morning, I do have a session where I'm gonna go a lot more into depth about migration in general, but also think about it not just from a performance monitoring and incident management perspective, but whether I'm doing platform migrations, so for example, Server 2008 migrations coming up pretty soon, right? And I need to understand what are all the things that this, these systems depend on, or whether you're actually starting to look at moving workloads out to the cloud. And we're getting a lot of interest in being able to leverage ADM for those, those particular use cases. So let me go ahead and jump in, give you a quick demo. There we go, okay. So here inside of the, uh, in the OMS portal, you'll see the new solution here, Application Dependency Monitor. It's gonna give you a quick view to how many systems have I discovered over all time, and we can see that we've, we've had 30 different systems connecting into the environment. We can see the breakdown across Windows and Linux, and then we can see how many are actively connected at this point. As I click in, now it's gonna load me up that list of all of the different systems, and then quickly bring me up a dependency map, in this case, for my BS Demo Cons 1. But so, like I talked about, let's go back to that incident management scenario. Let's say I'm a, a web server admin, and people are telling me that the Acme Customer Portal app is slow. So I'm gonna come in here and go to that system that I own, and here we can see 
We have, this is actually a, an Azure VM. It's running on an Azure VM scale set. And we can see right here, there's my Acme customer portal. So if I click on that, it's now going to quickly help me visually filter down to, for that one particular process, what are its backend dependencies? We can see a mixture of systems here, some where we actually don't have an agent deployed, so we can't tell you what process is running within there, but I can still tell you that it's trying to make a connection to this particular IP address over a specific port. But in this case, we can also see, here's my Tomcat system running on a backend app server. And so I know that as I start to think about context, I have visibility to those other things that may be upstream affecting the performance of the system that I own. So let's go back and say, okay, people were telling me that you know, roughly 4 a.m. this morning, people were starting to complain about performance issues with my Acme customer portal. So I can come in, get a view to it, and you can see same sets of systems. I can see that backend application server. But if you notice right here, I'm now starting to see there's an alert badge there. If I click in, I can now start to see issues. I'm getting high CPU, low memory. So we're pulling all this data from Log Analytics, right? You think about the context that we're providing on top of that big data platform that Joe was talking about with Log Analytics. And so now if I want to go look and get a better understanding, I can switch context over here, look at that application server. So even though I don't own that system, right, I'm not in charge of, of maintaining Tomcat there. I'm the web admin. I can come into a view that's going to help me say, should I, should I transfer this over to them? Is this an issue that they really need to be digging into? So again, I can see those alerts high memory, high CPU. But one of the other key things you're going to see here is change, like what Eamon talked about, right? And I can actually see somebody added this backup.pl process. Interesting. That actually seems a little bit strange, you know, because certainly all of our customers would be using the backup service that you're going to hear about more. So I'm not sure if this is some malware or someone put this in here, but I want to drill in and get a better understanding. So if we come back in here, I can actually now go into one of these CPU alerts and actually jump right into Log Analytics. So now I'm going to be able to see that alert and be able to have some context. And to make things a little bit faster, we went ahead and saved off some searches. So Joe talked about that analytics capability. Well, we can actually save off some of these queries. And I actually want to go look at, for that core system, let me get a sense, is this, has this been an ongoing issue? And I'll change the time range here so we can kind of focus in on the last six hours since it only happened a few hours ago. And I want to get an understanding, is this a systemic issue across this machine? What might actually be causing that problem for, for my app server? So we're going to see, you can see here, a whole bunch of spikes uh, pegging the CPU at, up at 100%. And I can actually go in and now say, all right, what might be driving that performance? So I'm just going to look at top processes in terms of contributing to, to CPU uh, utilization. So as this pulls it up, you can kind of think about this context, right? I've gone from the dreaded thing that we all get woken up with. The app is slow. OK, now what? I've come in. I've got a view of my system. I'm able to see its downstream dependencies. I'm able to see that it seems to be some issue with an app server. And I'm able to start to drill into log analytics and start to get a view to what may be causing these problems down to that individual process level. So as I filter this down, we're going to get a view of those top contributors. And if you actually look right here, I can really quickly filter in. There's that backup.pl process. So just to kind of summarize, we've got the ability to do the automatic discovery. We've got to be able to look at that live over historical time periods. And you're going to see us layering in more and more of this context. In fact, Mayor's going to come up here and talk to you a bit about security right now. And think about now, what if I'm able to integrate into those maps? Visibility to what patches may be missing, what security events might be there. So we're going to be doing more and more of that. So thank you very much. And again, I've got a session on, on Friday morning. We'd love to have you there. We're going to go into this in a, a lot more depth. No, it's OK. Hello. <laughs> Sorry for that. So my name is Mayo Mendelovic. I'm working on OMS Security. It's really a pleasure to be here with on, in front of all of you. Uh, I would talk a little bit briefly about what is OMS Security. I guess that some of you have at least seen that in the past. And I would show you a couple of interesting things. So first of all, the question that we need to ask is, why security in OMS? Operations and security? When we look at the market, we see companies that are doing security solutions, per se. That's it. Nothing else. They create these enormous silos of security stuff. This is one big silo. 
On the other hand, we see companies doing operation stuff, and they have one big silo for operation. You, guess what? The overlap between the, the two is actually huge. We have a lot of stuff that is security but not operation, and we have a lot of stuff that is operations and not security. But the overlap between the two is actually bigger than both of them. Think about it, the resources you're, man, you're monitoring. You're looking at the resource. You see that something goes wrong with this resource. Why, what's the problem here? Is it because the disk is making problems and you need to replace the disk? Or is it because someone took over this machine and is doing bit, uh, Bitcoin mining right now? Now, this is a not a fake example, believe me. This is a real example we see with real customer, big organizations. You know, hackers get in, and what they want, they want money, and if we can mine bin coins, that's a nice way to do. So on your CPUs, of course. Now, if we create these silos, we create a really crappy environment. Because we have the, the operation guy, you guys, usually, you see the problems, and there is the security problem that have no visibility to your world. And this, this communication, we think, makes the security solutions very less efficient than what we can do here by uniting both these worlds. So we are breaking the walls between the security and operations. We are bringing them together to the same place inside OMS, giving you the power to do security and giving the security people the visibility to what's going on in operations. And we think that the two worlds really makes better together here. So what is OMS security? OMS security has investments in three areas. The first area is the collection of data. Joe talked a lot about that. OMS is having so many great mechanisms to collect valuable data. And some of them are pure operations, some of them are security, but again, majority of them have both. We are collecting lo relevant logs for security and, and, and show it to you. But then just collecting the data is not really interesting. You want to analyze it. You want to see that. You want to understand your security posture. And then at the end, you want to gain insight. You want to see things that are very high level. Now, I would go briefly on three of, of, of these. So first of all, about the data. We are supporting Linux and, and, uh, and Windows. And all you need to do to make this work is install the OMS or SCOM agent that you already have. Now, it maybe sounds trivial to us, but if you look at the market, uh, you, th there are many solutions that require to do event complex event forwarding and install all kinds of solutions. Uh, sometimes I look at security solutions, they look to me like, a, uh, like the Lego instructions that my kid is building. Uh, take this, install that, and put this, and uh, my four-year-old is, is building Lego, I think, better than building these security solutions. So everything is working in a minute, in, in no time. And basically what we are doing, we are empowering everyone to do security because we want to enlarge the people that are engaged in security. We want to give security to more people. Another thing that we announced this week is the ability to get data from your security solution. So if I get into your data centers, I'm sure that I would find these boxes like your firewall, your IDS, your whatever boxes that you acquired with a lot of money. And sometimes these boxes are 10 years old and uh, the last software update you did there was five years. And the amazing thing is that we can take this data and pull it into OMS. So if you wanted to get this data today, you probably did grep or something like that, right? Yeah. So no grep no more. You can just pull this data using Ceph, common event format, which is supported by most security vendors out there. And you pull this data into MS, and you have it fully indexed, you have it enriched, and you have it with malicious IP identification, and all the goodies that you know and expect in OMS. And for some solutions that doesn't support uh, Ceph, we develop special Solution, special passing for them, like Cisco ASA. So if you have Cisco ASA, you can tomorrow go 
start taking these logs, pull them into OMS, and all the goodies that Joseph was showing you is available for you. But this is not enough. Just collecting data is not good enough. We believe that sometimes we need to go to the machine and, and perform some kind of assessments on the machine. So we have the update assessment that Imon showed you, which is giving you the security posture. And as the security guy in the room, I would tell you, the number one security problem that organizations are having is not patching the servers. If you just patch your server, trust me, you are in a much better security posture. So start with that. But then you also have anti-malware, and you want to see that status in, in cross-correlated with OMS. We are also having security baseline solution. I don't know how many of you are running the Windows security baseline configuration today, uh, but it was like really, really hard to, to, to execute them today. And, and we are just bringing this into OMS. So now every OMS node is evaluating the configuration of this machine against 150, 160 rules that Microsoft publishes the best, as the best practice for this machine. We are also bringing this to Linux soon. This is coming. And we are also, the last thing, the last assessment is about pulling all the identity stuff that is going on. So you would be able to get a clear view of who is logging into your servers. And trust me, if you go to your servers, there are people there that have admin rights from five years ago just because they needed to install a tiny bit. Now, if you look at the market, each one of them usually have a different agent. So you have this agent proliferation. And with OMS, we can have it in one place using one agent. Another thing that we are bringing, and we are baking this into the product, making it super easy to use, is threat intelligence. So we are taking the threat intelligence feed of malicious traffic and cross-correlate it with the logs. So again, something that usually was existing only on, this, on the security desk, we are bringing it to everyone. Because I guess that you want to know if your machine is accessed by a malicious IP. And believe me, you want to look, if your machine is sending data to a botnet, you want to know that. And last is about detection. Detection, again, was very hard in the past. You need to write all these rules and all these patterns and maintain them because new stuff coming all the time. And it was very complex and organizations simply didn't do that. So when we come to organization, we usually look at the rules and they were not updated six months, a year, two years. And this is a lifetime in, in, in security. So what we are bringing, we are bringing built-in engine that scans all the security records and look for patterns that we identify as malicious. We have a whole team of security researchers that define new patterns and adding them and keep adding them into the product. And we keep evaluating this set of products against all the attacks that, that we see in the market. So you always have a fresh set of detections. So if you want to see this in action, it takes a little bit more than than uh, 10 minutes. So I have a session right after that, 10.45, in room C112. I'm doing a crazy demo that I'm calling it moving from zero to security hero in less than an hour. And I'm showing you how you can install the entire thing, get up and running, see detection, see all that stuff in less than an hour. And I'm doing it in a way that you can replicate to your environment afterwards. So please come, see how, how it is done. And when you're back home, take your sandbox environment and try that with. It's available, everything available today. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, folks. Uh, I'm BJ. Uh, I'm a program manager from the Azure Backup team. Uh, Azure Backup is an integral part of the overall OMS suite. Uh, OMS is all about management. Uh, we talked about monitoring, log analytics, automation. Uh, protection and recovery is another important pillar as part of the OMS suite. So if you talk about operations management, how does that really uh, transform your uh, business, right? If you think about the context of backup, I'm sure most of you, or if not all of you, have some kind of backup in your environment. 
And when you start to take the cloud transformation, that you want to go from your either uh, partly on-premises and you're partly in the cloud or maybe uh, you know, starting out your uh, you know, g greenfield applications in the cloud, uh, you're looking at some kind of a solution that kind of uh, enables you to do backup, not just in on-premises, but even in the cloud. Right? So when you try to incorporate backup into your, uh, you know, uh, in this uh, new world of hybrid IT, uh, you may wonder, uh, what is backup, right? Is it just you know, storing bits and bytes in the cloud? Uh, or is it more than that? Can I also manage my uh, backup infrastructure from the cloud, right? So that's the vision we're on uh, as uh, part of uh, backup. So if you look at this picture, it's kind of a busy picture, but it gives you sort of a landscape of where we are, right? You have your applications deployed in private cloud, uh, maybe in the public cloud, and you have the infrastructure admin, and you have an application admin. If you look at the traditional backup solutions, uh, when they say I'm embracing cloud, they're usually doing one or two things. For instance, if they talk about backup to cloud, they're using cloud as just another storage target. Most of the intelligence is still on-premises. They're using the uh, cloud as just a storage target. They're backing up data just like they would do backup to disk or tape or just to cloud. All the intelligence is on-prem, and if you need to restore your data, you still have to pay a lot of egress costs. Then, if you think about moving your workloads to cloud, the same traditional backup solution will tell you, no problem, you can take your on-premises backup solution, run it in the cloud as a virtual machine. What have you done? Effectively, you've moved your problem from on-premises to cloud, and worst of all, you're paying for the compute costs for your backup solution in the cloud. For instance, if you have an A4 VM, you can back up, you know, let's say, uh, uh, 50 virtual machines or you know, 100 virtual machines. And the, there's a limit in how much you can back up with a single virtual machine. Right? Uh, if you deploy a traditional application in a virtual machine, let's say you can address 8 terabytes or 32 terabytes of disks. But if you scale your organization and you want to deploy more of your services on uh, Azure, you can't do that very easily. And you've got to deploy multiple compute instances of your backup applications in the cloud. And you may be paying for not, uh, not just that compute. If you have unused capacity, you're paying for that as well. So how do we look at uh, you know, backup in the context of modern IT is that you, as a customer, should not have to deploy any infrastructure to manage your backup environment. So it's not just about Storing your data in the cloud, you know, a very common answer we hear from customers is, hey, we're writing to blob storage, or we're using OneDrive for my backup, right? That's, that's good. I mean, you have a copy of your data. But, but if you think about management, that's the real change that we're uh, you know, embarking on. So from Azure Backup perspective, we look at cloud as the platform, a single platform where you can uh, not only store your data, but also manage that from a central place with all the capabilities that we have as part of OMS, like the log analytics, the alerts, and you know, a bunch of services that we have in Azure. So once we sort of kind of move beyond backup, right, then we start talking about uh, you know, Azure Site Recovery. We can start integrating all of these capabilities in a single dashboard. So if you have your workloads on-premises, you want to migrate them to cloud, and then you want to enable backup or have continued protection in the cloud, we can do that. Let's say you want to uh, uh, you know, leverage some of the security capabilities in Azure. For instance, multi-factor authentication, we, we start to leverage that. So we are able to bring all of those power of what you are able to do on-premises to the cloud and have a single place to manage all of your uh, infrastructure. So as I said, uh, Azure Backup is uh, you know, just, just two parts. I look at it as two ways, right? Yes, you can store it as a data plane, you can store your bits and bytes in the cloud, but we also look at it as a management plane. What that means, you can set your policies for your backup. You can manage your uh, you know, jobs and alerts uh, from a single dashboard. You can also have an in inventory or a look at all your assets that you're protecting, whether the data is on-prem or whether it's residing in the cloud. So let me just jump into a quick uh, show of uh, this particular capability. 
So here I have a uh, recovery services vault. Uh, this vault is created with, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know th this is an integrated vault where you have both your backup assets as well as your site recovery assets in one single place. Um, if I jump into the vault, this vault is actually acting as two parts. One is that's the, where the data is actually backed up. It's also the place where you can manage all of your backup and site recovery. Okay? If I just drill down into this, I can have a look at all the infrastructure that as part of the backup. For instance, what are my production servers in my environment? What are the backup management servers in my environment? Uh, if I want to go look at the jobs in the uh, backup, uh, you know, I can pull all of that data into a single place. So I have, here I can see all my uh, backups that are going on on-premises, my backups that are going to the cloud, and all the virtual machines that are backed up in the cloud in a single view. Now, if I want to go and configure my policies for my backup, I can go to the backup policies, and I see I have a default policy. I can create another policy uh, specifying that I want to backup, let's say, uh, weekly, policy. I choose a weekly schedule. Uh, I want to do it on Sunday. And I want to retain my backup. So obviously, you can retain your backup not just for short term, but also move, uh, you know, keep that for long term if you have a compliance requirement. I can say OK. And then if I need to configure backup for, let's say, uh, a set of virtual machines, I can go to the Getting Started tab. I can specify the goal for my backup, whether I want to backup my Azure virtual machines or if I have virtual machines or you know, infrastructure on-premises, I can pick that. Let me just choose Azure, which is easier to demonstrate. I can specify the backup policy. I just created a policy, so let me be able to, let me choose that weekly policy. And go to the backup items right here, and if I choose the databases and web virtual machines that I want to backup, I can just say OK. Once I pick that, you can see that uh, you know, it just in just a few clicks, I'm able to configure backup for my entire uh, environment. Uh, like Iman showed you, you can do this not just from the portal where you can configure one VM at a time, but you can also use the uh, automation runbooks to push backup policies and configure backup for a set of VMs, either through the PowerShell interface or through the templates. Uh, you know, and that way you can configure backup, and not just that. Once you've done, you can go back to the same dashboard, start looking at your jobs, and you can configure alerts if you have any job failures. Uh, let me just jump back to the. So we're running out of time. So there are a ton of investments that we've done in uh, Azure Backup. Uh, so obviously, we have uh, added the VM backup. We're also extending this for Azure SQL, which is the database. Uh, a database as a service backup for that. We've recently announced uh, the ability to backup not just Hyper-V, but we've added support for VMware. So from VMware environment, you can backup the data to cloud. Uh, you can store that data for offsite purposes, for long-term retention. Uh, and also, we've added uh, certain security capabilities to, let's say, enable um, uh, you know, protection from malware. So let's say you have been affected by malware, and you want to make sure your backups come to your rescue in case you were, your production service infected. You can go back to the portal, you know, recover your databases or recover your uh, environment uh, from that environment, right? Uh, so, so, so make sure you can, you know, uh, that not just that, we also have the ability to, uh, you know, if you try to do any critical operation, let's say a delete of a backup, uh, we also have the enforcements, the right checks and bounds to say, hey, please give us the uh, single one-time uh, password uh, so that, uh, you know, that way you do not uh, you know, uh, you know, make sure you have the right checks and bounds for deleting your backups. So, so a ton of investments. I can't talk about everything right now. So there was a session that we had yesterday, uh, you know, at uh, 1045. I recommend that you go back to that, uh, you know, the, the talk. We talk about all of these things in, in a great amount of detail. Thanks, uh, Vishal. Thank you, sir. To you. Okay, so Vijay talked about uh, data availability with our Azure backup service in our, um, OMS. We also have a service for application availability called Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site Recovery is a complete disaster recovery solution for your workload, be it running on VMware, Hyper-V, or physical platform. It works across all the operating system, be it Windows or Linux. 
Of course, we do traditional DR between two sites, but the key scenario we enable is DR to Azure because we understand DR is complex to set up a secondary data center, maintain that data center. With Azure, we give you the power to leverage Azure as your secondary data center and enable DR for all your workloads, which you are not even able to enable DR. The same service can also be used for migration. So we support migrating your workload from VMware, Hyper-V, and physical servers to Azure. We also support migrating your workloads from Azure to another Azure region or AWS to Azure. So with site recovery, we have uh, some key differentiators or the pillar. The first and the foremost is simple and cost-effective DR. We believe in giving you Azure as your secondary data center or as a DR site, so you don't need to invest in that. And we have built this DR service grounds up for a public cloud design point. So to do DR, there are a lot of vendors in the world, but to do DR, they expect you to run some infrastructure in Azure. This is a first-class multi-tenant service, so you don't need to run any infrastructure in Azure. Everything is offered as a pass service, like a, a pattern you see across all the OMS services. Heterogeneity is a key pillar because we know that workloads are across VMware, uh, Hyper-V, and even physical. We believe in enabling application availability. This is not just data replication or the VM replication. So we have invested in a lot of IP to ensure your complete application comes up in Azure by investing in features like an application consistent replication a replication which is consistent across multiple VMs, a capability which was possible only uh, complex and expensive SAN storage arrays. We invested in providing you capabilities like a one-click failover of a complete SharePoint form in Azure with uh, capabilities like recovery plan. We leverage different replication channels. We can leverage ASR's own replication channel, which is, hit, uh, uh, which is generic and works for all the workloads. We also le uh, leverage application replication channels, like for SQL, SQL always on, Oracle data guards, and things like that. And last but not the le least, a convert solution across your data availability as well as the backup availability, uh, application availability needs. Azure Site Recovery came as a leader in the Gartner's recent DRAS Magic Quadrant, and with this, let me quickly show a demo of how it works. Okay, so this is Azure Site Recovery. Uh, to enable replication for a multi-tier uh, SharePoint farm is pretty simple. You go to Settings, Getting Started, Site Recovery. Uh, there is a one-time step you need to perform on-prem where you install a Site Recovery replication server on-prem, takes few minutes. And once you have done that, you can start replicating your applications to Azure. So this is a VMware infrastructure. So I'll select that as a source. My target is Azure, and it asks me what is the storage account network I want to use for my application when I replicate this application or fail over this application to Azure. Now I can select different uh, SharePoint apps. So once you install this on-prem replication server, uh, on your vCenter environment, we discover all the VMs, their config, their application topology, and let you enable replication for those VMs. Uh, for ASR replication to work, we in ingest a small mobility service in the workload, so we ask you for an account by which we can inject that mobility service. And last but not the least, select an application policy with all the standard policy details. So enabling replication for a multi-tier SharePoint farm is as simple as few clicks from Azure Site Recovery. Now this will take some time because the whole SharePoint farm need to be replicated. So I have another vault where this SharePoint farm is already replicated. You can see the SharePoint web apps, uh, the app tier, DB tier. Now if you want to do a DR drill, ASR provides you no production impact DR drill with just a button click with a capability called uh, recovery plan. So you can go to ASR recovery plans and select ASR SharePoint recovery plan, and we want to perform a DR drill. So it's as simple as that. We want to go from on-prem to Azure, and since it's a no production impact DR drill, we ask you to select an isolated network in Azure and say, okay, it's as simple as that. All the orchestration to make sure your SharePoint app comes up successfully on the Azure is taken care by Azure Site Recovery. So this will take some few minutes. So if we want to see uh, what 
is the power of recovery plan, we can go to jobs view and see a recovery plan which is already executed. So I have executed a recovery plan. And you can see that Azure Site Recovery orchestrate the full failover of the SharePoint app. So for example, it will first uh, fail over the different servers in the SharePoint app, then it has dependency ordering, that first SharePoint SQL should come, followed by the app tier, followed by the web tiers, and we also have rich integration with Azure Automation, so you can do capabilities like post the web tiers have come up, you can inject, uh, you can enable RDP port 80 or enable load balancers and things like that. So with this, we provide you a very simple and cost-effective disaster recovery for your application availability needs. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have like one or two minutes left, but I only have one more slide, which is our uh, finish up slide, I think. Yep, so hopefully you got a view into just a set of capabilities we have inside of the operations management suite. As you know, we kind of went through all the four major pillars we have in there. Hopefully you saw not only the value in each one of those by themselves as you think about the whole infrastructure and your entire application, but also how these are starting to connect together. You know, you saw examples there where we're integrating with the backup, and backup integrates with automation, security integrates with log analytics, that ADM integrates with all of, all of the different capabilities. We really want to give this full, rich management solution that you can run from your cloud that actually integrates into your on-premises environment, Azure, or third-party clouds, not just for your infrastructure, but for your applications as well. That is the real power. And the thing about it is, you know, you saw it come through all the time, it's running from the cloud. And that makes a huge difference because not only do you get the scale and the performance requirements you need, you get the ability to actually get new capabilities very quickly as we invest more and more into the cloud and into management from the cloud. So that's kind of one of those key differentiators as you think about using OMS inside your environment. It can integrate with your system center investments, but allows you to take it to the next level and get that full management across everything you have in your environment. Okay, with that, I think we're down to like one minute. So I know there's so much content in here. I appreciate everyone coming because there's just, you know, we're really excited about OMS. Hopefully you guys saw a lot inside of there. And I did include two slides. It just shows how much content that's being shown today around, or this week around OMS. These are available in the slides. You can look them up as yourself for the rest of the week and see the sessions. But for each one of those areas, there's a whole deep dive that gives you that knowledge to say, how can I use it inside my organization? But the key thing to think about is, as a whole suite, they integrate together, and you can leverage them all as one single management surface. Okay, with that, I want to thank everyone. I appreciate you coming, and uh, have a good rest of the week.